So yeah, it's going to be five years next month since we published this um, Uncivilization, the Dark Mountain Manifesto. And there are probably some people here who've uh, read it and some people here who've never heard of it and uh, a sort of scale in between. But what we thought we would do tonight is to, to revisit it and um, the reactions that we had and uh, the reactions that we get now and how that has changed and what that says about how the world has changed in the last five years, what it says about what we've learned about how to express what we were trying to do in the first place and some of the things that we've learned along the way. I spent some time this afternoon reading, rereading some of the things that were written about this manifesto and about Dark Mountain when it first came out. And it was quite an uncomfortable experience. It took me back to some of the Will discomfort. Will you tell us why you called it Dark Mountain? Yeah. We will, we will. We will. We'll, we'll, we'll get Let us get that. there, Satish. We will get there. Yeah. <laughs> it was an uncomfortable experience because a lot of the initial reactions that we had to this were quite hostile. Um, and you know, I suppose one of my worst moments over the last five years was being at an event in London where John Berger, one of my great heroes, one of the writers who for me has been very important to the spirit of Dark Mountain, had been in conversation with Jay Griffiths, another writer who's been very involved herself with Dark Mountain, who's written for our books. And it really felt like you know, we were in this place that was very close to the core of the spirit of what this whole project is about. <coughs> and afterwards, I was stood in the lobby of the British Library and I got talking to this young man who was stood next to me, and he was you know, interested in this journal that I edited. And then when I said Dark Mountain, I saw a bell ring in his head, and I saw the expression on his face change. He said, oh yes, I know about you. <laughs> he sort of turned away. And you know, if it had happened anywhere else, it would probably have cut me less deeply. But in that particular environment, where this was clearly somebody who shared my love of John Berger and his ideas and his way of expressing things. Uh, it, it, was, it was this experience which I had a few times reading the things that people wrote about us at the beginning that was a bit like looking in a mirror and seeing somebody else instead of yourself on the other side of the mirror. The things that, the ways that people were describing what we had written. Well, I'll read you some of them because this is why I was rereading them this afternoon. So, John Gray wrote a review of the Dark Mountain Manifesto in the New Statesman. And it's not often that a sort of a 30-page self-published pamphlet gets given a, a lead review in the New Statesman. And he said some nice things about it, but he also said that we were romantic dreamers who believed that social breakdown could be the prelude to a better world. Um, and George Monbiot picked up that theme in The Guardian, and he, uh, he was a bit more direct. He said... You would purge the planet of industrial civilization at the cost of billions of lives. <laughs> how, how do you defend this position? Good old George. Um, yeah. Yes. Uh, and then somebody called Solitaire Townsend sort of picked up on uh, George's article and wrote one which said, Get down off your dark mountain, you're making things worse. <laughs> and she said, When I first discovered the Dark Mountain Project, I couldn't help secretly hoping a bunch of uber cool hipsters were making a satire. Um, and uh, someone who I knew, Matt Jones, um, ca called us crazy collapsitarians. Um, and uh, I don't know about you, Paul, but I, I don't feel it, find it particularly comfortable. I don't, I'm, some people manage to take pride in being attacked. Mm. And they feel like it's a validation, a vindication. They must be, you know, if you're upsetting people, you're really doing something right. I'm not very like that. Uh, it was quite an uncomfortable time. But I think part of the difficulty is that you know, when you're trying to say something for the first time, it doesn't come out simply and straightforwardly. There's never been a, a short summary of what Dark Mountain is. Even the name uh, works in some ways because it has a whole set of resonances rather than um, you know, describing something. It's not like starting a journal that's called The Ecologist. Um, or resurgence. It doesn't have a straightforward um, explanation contained in the name of what it is and what it does. And I think one of the things we've learned over the last five years is that 
the difficulty in explaining what Dark Mountain is and what it does is, as the, the, the tech guys say, it's a feature, not a bug. Uh, it's, it's actually, it's not a problem that needs to be fixed. It's a difficulty that becomes helpful if we stay with that difficulty. But I think it would probably be good at this point, Paul, for you to just sort of take us through a mm. bit what we actually wrote in the manifesto and why people might have read it in the ways that led to those reactions, <laughs> which framed for a lot of people their perception of what Dark Mountain is. You know, I'm sure that that guy who I met at the Berger event had never read a thing that Paul or I had written or a thing in an issue of Dark Mountain. But he had certainly read something that somebody else had written about us that had presented it in that kind of frame. So Yeah, and people who found this threatening found it threatening because they felt that it undermined their sense of necessary hope. And they felt that they needed a sense of necessary hope and that we were arguing against it, which wasn't actually what we were doing. But let me answer your question, Satish, and tell you why it's called Dark Mountain. And I'll do it by reading out the poem that starts the, starts the manifesto. And this is a poem that was written by the Californian poet Robinson Jeffers in 1935, and it's called Rearmament. Okay? And it's written during the time of the run-up to the Second World War. And Jeffers could see the war be about to begin in Europe, and he could also see America being whipped up to enter the war, and he didn't think America, sh America should do so. But he also knew that there was nothing he could do about it. So he found himself living in his house on the cliff in California, watching these great wheels turning, and knowing that they'd gone past a certain point, and he could see the war was coming, and he could see how destructive it would be, and he could see that he couldn't do anything to stop it. Okay? This is the poem. These grand and fatal movements toward death... The grandeur of the mass makes pity a fool. The tearing pity for the atoms of the mass, the persons, the victims, makes it seem monstrous to admire the tragic beauty they build. It is beautiful as a river flowing or a slowly gathering glacier on a high mountain rock face bound to plough down a forest. Or as frost in November, the gold and flaming death dance for leaves or a girl in the night of her spent maidenhood bleeding and kissing. I would burn my right hand in a slow fire to change the future. I should do foolishly. The beauty of modern man is not in the persons, but in the disastrous rhythm, the heavy and mobile masses, the dance of the dream-led masses down the dark mountain. Now, I read that poem at a time when I was looking at climate change and feeling the same way that he was feeling when he looked at the Second World War. I was seeing this enormous thing, which isn't approaching, it's already here. And I was seeing how much of this stuff was already up in the atmosphere, how many changes we were clearly already committed to, and all of the things that the scientists were saying, and the crumbling ice caps, and all of the terrible stories that we all know about, so we don't need to go over them. And I was also seeing the mass extinction underway that we all know about as well, and all of the general ecological horrors that have been unleashed. And I was seeing that the momentum of civilization was going in the wrong direction. And after many years of campaigning, writing and activism, I didn't feel that I could actually change that. And I didn't think that collectively we had much hope of changing that in the short term either. So we were committed <coughs> to something very dangerous and serious. We're committed to collapse because we're already in it. We're committed to a sense that the climate is going to do something extremely radical and we don't know what. That there's all sorts of spiralling ecocide underway and we are having to live through it. Now that doesn't mean nothing can be done, but it does mean that at the moment... We're in this momentum, which we, we are powerless to stop and we don't know how. And many, many people seem to feel like this. I certainly felt like this. Um, and it was at this point that I met Dougald and we went to the pub. And you should never go to the pub and have a couple of pints and write a manifesto. Okay? <laughs> because I am still dealing with the consequences five years later. Um, but we found that we both felt the same. And we also found that we both felt, and this is one of the other central claims of this manifesto, that not only are we in this age of collapse and we need to name it as that, however dark it looks. And the reason it's the Dark Mountain Project is because we think it's important to look at the darkness, not to wallow in it, but to look at it and to name it and not to pretend it isn't there. And to name our, the limits of our power within that as well. But also that we felt that culturally in the civilization that we're living in, none of this is really being represented, certainly in the mainstream. You look at the novels that are being published, you look at the, the books that are reviewed, you listen to the music, you look at the mainstream of the culture and you think, well, in a hundred years' time, if people can look back, assuming there are any people left, 
on the, on the books and the, and the cultural output of this, this society now, knowing what they know and what we knew about the actual state of the world, about all of this terrible stuff that's unfolding, wouldn't they think this was, this was just insulting, if, or, or at least very inappropriate? It's as, if, it's as if this isn't happening. As a culture, we're acting as if this isn't really happening. Or occasionally, as if, it, well, it is happening, but we can fix it, probably, quite easily with technology and politics, and so we don't have to treat it as a cultural shift. We don't take it seriously as a culture. And as writers, we both felt that we ought to take it seriously as a culture. And the central claim of this manifesto really is that this collapse that is underway, that is real and that has to be named, it's a crisis of culture as much as anything else. It's a crisis of stories, which sounds a strange thing to say, but the cause is not a technological one or a political one or an economic one. It's a, it's a narrative one. We believe the wrong stories about the way the world is and our place in the world. Every culture, every civilization is built on stories. We tell ourselves myths, not in the sense of lies, as we often use that word now, but in the sense of founding narratives, the way that we look at the world. And the way that this culture looks at the world is so out of whack with the way the world actually is that it's driven us into these buffers that we're hitting now, all around. The things that we believe, and on our course, on our short course here this week, we've been spending a lot of time together trying to pin down what some of these narratives might be. We've got a huge list on the wall that's getting longer every day. It's been a very interesting, very interesting experience to try and tease out what these unspoken assumptions in our culture are. And a few of them that we identified in the manifesto are firstly the myth of progress, which the whole manifesto is built around, the idea that everything always gets better for humanity and that technology and industry are the primary reasons why it gets better and every generation will be better off than the last one. And that's a kind of almost like a law of history, just like gravity is a law of physics. Another of these myths is the centrality of human beings, that when you look at the planet Earth, you look at it as, as if humans were the pinnacle of evolution, and you look at it through the eyes of humans and through the needs of humans. So the Earth is not a great community of living creatures. It's, a, it's an environment for humans to be in, which is deeply central <coughs> to the way that we look at the world. And tied to that is the myth of nature, the idea that there is something called nature which is out there and that you're separate from it somehow. You're, not, you're just in it, you're walking through it, but you're not the same thing as it. It's an external thing which you can either romanticise or, or turn into toilet paper. But either way, you can use it for your own ends. And connected with that is this idea of objectivity, objective, rational thought, which allows us to look at this thing called nature and break it down into little parts and, and measure it and manipulate it, either to save the planet or to destroy the planet, whatever we happen to think we want to do, but it, that's within our power. And there are any number of other little sub-stories, but just identifying these and naming them as ways that we see the world. And the last story, perhaps the one that Dougal talks about a lot, is that we've grown out of stories, that we don't need stories anymore, that the way we see the world isn't a story, it's just the facts. So when we look at uh, what science can teach us, for example, we don't see that as a useful and necessary thing that is part of a way of seeing the world. We see that as the truth, which replaces all the previous ways of seeing the world which were wrong. And we believe it's true. So we believe our stories aren't stories, and that's the most dangerous story of all. And when you start to do this, when you start to question your own stories and when you start to see the world as a narrative challenge, you come to the conclusion that the stories we have to tell ourselves have to be different ones. And that the people who do that, or at least some of the people who do that, will be writers and creative people and artists. And that's the kind of the central claim of the manifesto. And when we started this manifesto, I remember we had a, an idea that there was going to be a little journal in which we were going to collect some of this writing, which we called uncivilised writing. Okay, the idea being that civilization is an idea as much as a thing. And to uncivilise yourself is to take yourself out of that structure, out of these stories, and start to see the world differently. So we were going to have a little journal of uncivilised writing and perhaps a small writer's group of people who would get together and talk about this. And so we published this manifesto and very quickly a lot of people got involved. We had emails from everywhere, we had people coming in from all over the world, many of whom weren't writers at all. Um, we had writers and musicians and artists and scientists and farmers and activists and former activists and people who didn't like to define themselves from across the world actually. Um, and it quickly got out of control. Um, <laughs> but what we realised was that this had happened for a, uh, one very good reason, which is not that we'd said something brilliant that no one had ever thought of before, almost the opposite. We said something that a lot of people were already thinking but were afraid to talk about. 
Okay, we raised this flag and we said, look, this darkness is going on. We have limited control over it. We're not sure what to do, but we're pretty sure that we need to start questioning why it's happening and rewriting these stories. And it's okay to say that. And a lot of people came out, and they still do. And every week we get emails from people around the world saying, thank you for saying this, because I've been saying this and everybody thinks I'm mad. And I thought I was alone, and I've realized I'm not alone. And what I think we've realized over the last five years is there's a big shift gone on mm -hmm. in the way that people are seeing things um, in terms of this sense of being able to speak about this and kind of name this darkness almost. Yeah, I mean, one passage that I came across recently that I think echoes very strongly with that core of what we were trying to say in the manifesto was um, Mike Hume, um, his uh, book, Why We Disagree About Climate Change. Um, and he's a scientist you know, who's been at the heart of um, scientific research on climate change. And the passage I'm thinking of, he says, you know, climate change is not a problem to which we are going to come up with solutions. It's a challenge to our whole way of understanding ourselves and the situation in which we find ourselves. And so I think this was the, the thing for us, recognising that you know, if, 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 if what we're hitting up against is actually a challenge to our whole way of making sense of who we are, what we are, what this world that we're in is, and there's not going to be a way around it which doesn't involve actually confronting and uprooting a lot of the assumptions that we have at the moment about that, then it really is a cultural challenge and the ways in which we, I mean, both of us have been very involved in the environmental movement uh, and lots of people around Dark Mountain have been and continue to be, um, but that most of the ways in which the movement we'd been part of had attempted to engage with culture had been too superficial. It had been using culture as a delivery mechanism for a message, a message that was coming from science, a message that was coming from the campaigners. And you know, we want artists, we, you know, we want to publish a book of short stories about climate change because that way we'll get people to realise how serious this is. Instrumentalising culture and creativity. And you know, I think part of what we were clear about was that actually there's a deeper level than that at which this is a cultural challenge and something which has to be addressed without thinking we know what the answers are and what the actions we need to take are and we just need to package that in a nice you know, um, sort of art or culture as a, a, a sophisticated form of PR that actually right down in the depths of the strangeness of where writing and art comes from is we have to get down there to deal with the depth of the mess that mm. we're in. And you have to excavate the stories as well. Yeah. And um, so what we quickly discovered was that we had a shape-shifting monster on our hands um, and that this thing that was supposed to be a writer's group turned into much more of a cultural thing, a cultural conversation, even a cultural movement. And in the last five years, that's built up into a lot of different shapes. And we now publish two journals every year, big hardback books of uncivilised art and writing, and that comes in from all over the world, and that's everything from essays to fiction to flash fiction to poetry to visual art, which is responding to the challenge of the manifesto and the conversation that's gone on. We've held four big festivals. We've stopped holding them now because we were going mad, uh, trying to run a big festival and publish two books a year with a small number of people and virtually no money. Um, but as uh, there are other events happening as a spin-off of those, but we have brought that, those festivals brought together huge numbers of people from all across the world. And what we discovered was that it's been very interesting. The initial reaction to the manifesto, which assumes that we're mad and we want civilization to collapse, or that well, that's, that's, one, that's one line of attack. The other line of attack is, is from activists themselves who say you shouldn't be talking about this stuff because it stops people being hopeful and active, and that's damaging, so just don't say it, even if you think it's true. Um, yeah, pe you know, people said to us, OK, you've burned out. It happens. <laughs> but you're meant to go and do it quietly in a corner, and you either come back for another round or you retrain as an acupuncturist. Um, and I think one of the best things that's happened with Dark Mountain is it's created a space where people who have been through, you know, who have done their time within the movements that we've been part of, instead of feeling like they have to sit on their own with the darkness and the, the experience that gets labelled as burnout, actually come together and question and realise that this isn't an end state, a dead state. This is actually part of a larger process. 
Mm. And one of the things that goes on within that process is starting to question what is it about the movements we've been part of that has normalised the idea that we use human beings as fuel. You know, we treat burnout as a natural part of the cycle of being an activist. In other words, we run our organisations and our movements by using people as fuel. And there's something not right about that. And I think that you know, the conversations that went on with the people who came together at the festivals began to open up a space where it was possible to try and puzzle through and make sense of, of that and think about other modes of action that continue mm. to make sense without having to hold your, sort of the, the dark side of what you're feeling about the situation out of view for fear of you know, discouraging others within your group. And one of the responses too, which is, which is a real a kind of dichotomy that you get particularly from activists, is that you're either being active or you've given up. Mm. We'll talk a little bit more about that in, the minute, in a moment, but the number of people who said to me privately who were involved in kind of public activism, who said, yeah, I know this is true, I know we're screwed. Okay, we know that the, we know we've got all this climate change in the system, we know we can't stop it and all the rest of it, but we can't say that. Mm. Because if we say that, everyone will despair, and that's bad. So we have to keep pushing the message out. And it's like listening to a priest saying, I don't really believe in God, yeah. but I just kind of have to do this stuff, you know? <laughs> it's my job, I don't want the, what will the, what will the flock think? Yeah, it's my job to believe in God. Well, exactly. You know, what, what will the flock think if I tell them I've lost my faith? And so I'm not going to tell them, even though it's a sham, because it's probably good for them to not know the truth. And it felt like that. And one yeah. of the interesting things, by the way, is that very little of this criticism happens now. Mm. It's very interesting. One of the things to talk about is the big shift that's happened in the public consciousness over the last five years. We don't get these attacks anymore, or at least very few of them, yeah. actually, because... Not, I think for two reasons. Firstly, because it's clearer now what we're doing and what we're not doing, and that we're not calling for the collapse of everything or wallowing in doom, but also because publicly the conversation has moved on so far. I remember when we wrote this manifesto, all the climate change campaigners were still talking about stopping climate change. Mm -hmm. And nobody talks about that anymore. Now they talk about preventing it from being too bad. Hopefully we can stop it going over two degrees. And in five years' time it'll be four degrees. And that's the reality of it. And that's not to blame anybody for that. That's just the reality of the situation. The, 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 everything is shifting very quickly. And the kind of stuff we were writing about economic collapse and ecological collapse five years ago, and other people were as well, plenty of others were, is now in, in newspapers. It's on the front pages sometimes, and it's in comments, and it's, in, you know, it, it's getting into the public conversation because the, the reality of that is dripping through to people. And so what we've ended up with is this giant international conversation about where that takes you and where you go. And what still makes sense if that is true? Because it's not as if you either act in the conventional way, regardless of the useless usefulness of that, or you give up and die. And those are the two options that are prevented, often presented to you by particular forms of sort of activism and also politics and these kind of ways of seeing things. You can either do this thing to stop the bad stuff, or you may as well give up. And actually, everything else is in between. And that's what you kind of have to deal with. And it's interesting to think just a little bit about when I think about why it matters and why, why we actually bother to do this, because it's a lot of work, <laughs> why, why would you do it? One of the reasons is that people keep coming and saying it matters. Mm. And it's interesting to look at the reasons that they say it, it matters. And just a few that I, I sort of jotted down earlier from just thinking about some of the correspondence I've had. I mean, per people, firstly, they say, I'm very glad that I'm not alone in thinking like this, because I've been looking at the world like this too, and I thought nobody else thought this way and I couldn't even talk to my family about it, and now I realise there are lots of other people who feel the same. And the, the, the value of that is actually very high. The second thing is, it's okay to feel like this, actually. It's okay to look at this horror and feel grief about it, and to be miserable about it, and to, be, f to feel powerless about it. It's okay to feel like that. That's a rational response. It's not the way you're going to want to feel forever, but it's a rational response reasonable response to actually knowing what you know about the way of the world and you don't have to bury it. Thirdly, it's okay to have a space to explore what that means without thinking that you don't automatically have to come to a conclusion, without thinking you have to have an answer or develop a five-point plan or immediately act in some way. You may end up acting in all sorts of ways but it's okay to just sit with that and explore it and actually figure out what it means to live through it. Mm. And then I suppose the, the last one which is interesting is that so many people say this gives them a sense of hope. And this is, this is the most interesting thing to me. 
because people who don't really know what Dark Mountain is and who look at it from the outside, particularly if they're sort of traditional activist or political people, say, you're, you're just depressing people. This is just about wallowing in grief. What are you doing talking about this? Why don't you go and do something more positive? Whereas a lot of people who do read it and take it on board because it speaks to them say, what you've done is lifted a weight off my shoulders because what I've realised is that it is okay to look at this and it is okay to feel like that and it is actually, I mean it's interesting to me how many people have said I felt much more despair when I was involved in a big environmental campaign because I had to keep trotting out a message I didn't believe in and I didn't think it would work but I felt I had to say it anyway and now I've come here and I've realised I don't have to say it and I can figure out what would actually still be useful to do. And so in some ways we get to this point that we talked about in the manifesto where you find the hope beyond hope. You dump the, dump the false hope and actually ask yourself what is still meaningful and useful. Mm. And that, to me, has been the most surprising thing that I've learned from doing this, how hopeful and exciting people find it, which wasn't quite what I'd expected when I started it, I have to say. Mm. But, so have we succeeded in confusing you yet? <laughs> um, or at least in sharing some of our possible... Do you, did you want to ask the, something? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, <laughs> no, I, no. I, I think actually you know, there is a danger sometimes that the scale of climate change as a crisis and the hold that it has on our imaginations you know, pushes everything else out of the picture and we use it as a shorthand for talking about the mess that the world is in and actually the mess that the world is in is a tangle of crises of which climate change is perhaps the sort of underlying base note but there is this whole... You know, stack of discord on top of it and interconnected with it, quite obviously. And also that climate change is one of many ecological balances which are being tipped entirely out. And if we woke up tomorrow to find that climate change was, a, was a, a scam or the scientists had got it all wrong and it was fine, you'd still be living in an age of mass extinction and, and, and yeah. any number of other things. So that's the one that gets the attention because it's so novel and urgent in some ways. Um, but it's, it's one of this great matrix of things, as you say, that, that, mm. that it's all sort of connected with the way that we've been doing things, as I'm sure we all know here. So we thought that before we sort of throw this open to a, um, a discussion, um, we'd just try and go through a few things that we feel like we've learnt five years on through the, the journey that we've been on and from the people who we've met along the way, because I think one of the most important things to say about this is that, yes, this started as a conversation between two guys in a pub, and it wasn't, you know, people often assume that Paul and I must have been old friends and we'd known each other for years and we cooked up this plan. Actually, that wasn't how it happened. We sort of met each other in much the same way as many people have met us and met each other through Dark Mountain over the past few years. As it happens, uh, I was reading Paul's blog and leaving the occasional comment. He started reading my blog and then he wrote a couple of things that just struck such a deep chord with me. And I thought, I'm going to get in touch with this guy and... Uh, after a few months I got round to, to doing it. And so we've kind of got to know each other through this process of working together on this. And along the way, at various points where we were nearly losing it, and you know, one thing we've learned is don't try and start a small publisher and a small festival simultaneously within the small, same small non-profit business. There's a reason why people don't do it. It's mad. A funder once said to me, how many miracles do you want me to believe? I hope the answer is one. Um, and so we were really trying to do too many miracles for a while with um, Dark Mountain. And it, we, we got away with it, but we only got away with it. And the price that you pay when you're trying to do too much at once is the lots of little small moments of carelessness that we, where you're not able to give people or tasks the kind of attention they really deserve. Most of them are small, but none of them are unimportant. And what saved us from it was the people who uh, saw, reflected in what we were doing, something that was also what they were doing. And you know, at points where we were trying to explain um, what this thing that we were reaching towards was, and you hit that moment where you stumble and someone picks up your sentence and finishes it for you in a way that you wouldn't have thought of, 
but that actually gives you back the thing that you were trying to say. And so over the last five years, you know, various people have stepped into the circle of the kind of those who've been carrying the weight of this project, and the project would not still be here if it wasn't for all of those people, as well as us. But, um, yeah, it's, it, I think it's worth us just kind of talking through a few of the things which mm. we've personally... We sat down earlier and we tried to, to think about um, a few things that we've learned that we didn't know before, perhaps. Mm. Um, and we listed five. Um, and we can, there'll be lots more, I'm sure, mm. and we can all talk about that in a minute. This is just the things that have come to us as a result of doing this thing, which turned into something actually quite different from what we'd intended to do. Okay? The first one of these things is that grief matters. This is not what I expected to learn from trying to set up a writer's group. But we talked about this quite a lot this week, and it comes up again and again, and it comes up all around the conversations we have, usually unintentionally. This sense that we're living in this great age of loss, and I could read you statistics, but there's no point. You probably know them anyway. We know about how many species are disappearing and the rate that the forests are going and the acidifying of the seas and all of this stuff. We know about this. We can experience it, or we can read about it, or we can listen to the scientists telling us about it. The great age of loss. And you can't get through that if you're aware of it without grieving it and without mourning it and without feeling it. You've got to do that, and you've got to sit with that. And it's so important not to just rush over it and say, well, bad stuff is happening, but what can we do? Mm. Okay? That's, you do need to think about what you can do and how you can live, but the first thing you have to do is just acknowledge it, because there's so much grief around this, and it's not named. It's not named enough. And it was really surprising to me to see how many people came to Dark Mountain with this, and that so many of the things they wanted to talk about when they actually sat around a fire was this sense of grief. And when you can share it, it's shared. It's a shared burden. And it has to be acknowledged. Just like any grief, the loss of a loved one or the collapse of a relationship or anything, you have to have time to grieve that and deal with it and understand what it means to you. And it's been very informative and useful for me to know how important it is to acknowledge that and kind of name it as part of that, the, you know, the darkness of life. And just be, be there with it. And that's been a really interesting revelation to me. Can I ask a question? Yeah. So once you've named it and kind of owned it, can you then, how can you continue to be, can you continue to be with it all around you from then on? Well, that's the challenge, that's the challenge, isn't it? You, it's, it's like, um, we, we talked about this in one of our sessions the other day, this kind of um, famous Kubler-Ross model of the five stages of grief that some people might know about that you go through when somebody you love dies or maybe you've got a terminal illness or something and you start off by simply denying its existence, not wanting to think about it. Then you might get angry and furious about it and want to do something about it. Then you might go through this bargaining phase where you try and see if you can get a few more years of life or something by doing something. And then, then you get to depression where you just go, God, it's not worth anything. And then when you've got through that, you get to this stage of acceptance somehow. And that's not a linear progress. It goes all over the place when you're grieving anything. But eventually you get to the process of acceptance. Like when someone close to you dies, you will get to the point somehow at some time through some process where you have accepted it. It's still there with you. It's still a loss. You know, it's still real, but you have to accept it and get on with your life. You, you have to sort of move on with it. So it's, 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 as much as anything, it's just acknowledging that it's a loss mm. and not pretending that it's not happening or that it can be turned around. And there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a ground that's important to walk on between kind of denying that it matters or that it's a loss and not talking about it and saying, oh, that's so awful, there's nothing I can do. It's, it's, all, it's all worthless and it's getting to that point, which is a different journey for everybody. And the, the danger is that if we don't take this stuff seriously, then our activity becomes an activity to avoid thinking about it, to avoid being with the grief. And at that point, we get very resistant to questioning, you know, is the action that I'm taking meaningful action? Or is it action for the sake of keeping busy to try and not think about the horror? And, you know, yeah, people often in the early days with Dark Mountain were you know, troubled by, or from a distance when they first heard about it, rather than when they actually came and met people and got involved were troubled by the emphasis on darkness.
But to me, that's very important because you, know, you have to actually sit with the dark and let your eyes adjust and then see what you notice and see what kinds of space of possibility, what forms of action, what kinds of hope live in, grow in the darkness as distinct from the possibilities that you were telling yourself were there, the kinds of action that you were engaged in, the kinds of hope that are perhaps more like wishful thinking that can only be sustained if you try really hard and put lots of energy into not dwelling with the darkness. And so are you trying to say to, <clears throat> to remove the darkness or celebrate the darkness? to live with the darkness rather than seeing it as something to be conquered or subdued or eliminated. And one core part of that, which relates to but is not quite the same as the piece that Paul was talking about in relation to grief, is death. And somebody said to me you know, relatively early on in an online discussion about Dark Mountain, you know, well, OK, yeah, you're making some good points, but you should stop going around saying we're all going to die. And I said, well, firstly, I don't think that we've actually been going around apocalyptically saying, oh, it's the end of the world, we're all going to die. In fact, one of the key lines in the manifesto is, the end of the world as we know it is not the end of the world, full stop. And one of the things that we have to take time to come to terms with is the difference between losing many things that we grew up taking for granted and losing the possibility of worthwhile, livable human existence. But... You know, part of this process is actually coming to terms with the fact that in a non-apocalyptic sense, we are all going to die. <laughs> you know, we're all, all of us... Not, not all, not, all hopefully Probably not all not at the same altogether. time. No. Yes. <laughs> hopefully not. No. <laughs> Unless it's a terrible disaster at Schumacher College. Yes. Tonight. You never know. Um, you never know. So, God willing. Um, but, you know, this body is going to be buried or burnt. Death is coming to all of us sooner or later. And we come out of cultures and societies that have you know, been really bad at living with the reality of our own mortality. You know, we keep it so out of view. That's the darkness that we try and do everything to hide ourselves from. We have medical professions that very often fall into the habit of treating death as failure rather than dying as something... You know, we have the phrase, an untimely death, which suggests that there is also the possibility of a timely death. But the idea of a timely death, the idea of dying well, is something that's quite taboo within mainstream culture and the societies that most of us have grown up in. And I think that this is particularly important because one of the things I've realised over the last five years is that one of the undealt with issues for a lot of us within the movements that I was part of um, has been the extent to which we end up projecting our fear of our own death onto the planet. And actually some of the things that we have said about you know, saving the planet, the, the anxiety about the fragility of the planet has had an excess of energy that's coming from our anxiety about the fact that we are going to die. And I really think that uh, unless we have spent time sitting with, looking at, and my friend Vinay Gupta, who's a pretty crazy man, um, who we've done some stuff with over the years with Dark Mountain, talks about the... He wrote for the second Dark Mountain book about the, the Kapalka, the skull bearer, uh, one of the Indian traditions of the, um, the lineage that he's been connected to. You know, people who literally carried a skull and ate their meals out of it to live with the reality of their own death. But you know, unless we have come to terms with the reality of our own death, we're probably not fit to face the extent of the mess that we, were, we are in on a planetary scale right now, because when we face it, we will be always at risk of muddling it up with our aversion from the reality of our own death. So you know, sitting with the reality of the fact that we're going to die and letting that travel from being a fact, from being information, to being something that we know and feel and come to terms with and make part of how we find meaning in our lives and realising that the fact that we're going to die doesn't cancel out meaning. That perhaps without it, meaning wouldn't work in the same way as you know, a sentence needs a full stop. Um, I've tried reading Finnegan's Wake. <laughs>
Um, but yeah, that's definitely been for me one of the core things mm. and one of the things that people seem to have really found Dark Mountain a space within which they can sit with grief and with the reality of mortality <coughs> without being rushed. And the, 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 the next thing we learned is that none of that equals giving up. Mm. This is the important bit. Um, people often say, oh, you've given up. You've given up. You don't want to do a particular form of activism anymore. You want to talk about this dark stuff. You've given up. Um, you know, and I say, well, what do you think I've given up on? Exactly. And it's, it's, you don't often get an answer. Because this doesn't equal giving up anything, particularly. It may equal giving up on a form of action that is ineffective. It may equal giving up on false hope. It may equal giving up on telling yourself stories that turn out not to be true. But it doesn't mean you've given up on life. It doesn't mean you've given up on being able to make a meaningful difference to some things in your own view. It doesn't mean you've given up on action. It doesn't mean you've given up on love for life at all. In fact, in some ways, it concentrates that and makes it clearer. It just means you've given up on lying to yourself. That's all. Um, it, doesn't mean anything of the, it doesn't mean anything else. And that's quite important to understand and to hold on to. This is not about giving up. There's no point in having a movement based on giving up. It wouldn't, I don't think it would have been as popular. You know, <laughs> Let's all give up on doing anything. You may as well just go to the pub on your own. If you're do that. It's actually about getting real about what you can still usefully do, given that the times we're in, and getting real about the fact that the times we're in are not the times we used to be in, and that the, the speed and the rapidity of that change. Um, and getting real about the level of power that we wield and don't wield as well, actually. There's a certain degree to which we're powerless in some things, and we don't like to acknowledge that. And once you acknowledge the limits of your own power and the abilities of your own actions, then you can start saying, well, what can I still do that's actually useful? And then the questions start to get interesting. One other thing that we learned, which we've talked about already, is the importance of stories. This has become really clear to me. I mean, I was a writer anyway, and I always loved reading stories and writing them, but the importance of the way that stories are threaded through the way that we see the world and that our perception of the world is not the same thing as the world. I went on a Buddhist retreat last October, a Zen Buddhist retreat for five days in the hills of Wales, which I've been building up to for years, and I finally went and got a bit cracked open there. And um, I had one of those, thing, those revelations that you sometimes have, which are actually just bleeding obvious, but until you actually feel them, you don't really realise it. And I, I, I realised through days of meditating and talking and walking outside that the world and my perception of the world are not the same thing. Okay? Which is, as I say, extremely obvious, isn't it? But until you actually see it and feel it, you don't really get it. You look at this hill and you think a hundred other people could look at that hill and see different things and have different feelings related towards it. And the stories I'm telling myself are stories. It doesn't mean they're not true. But as a culture as well, we tell ourselves stories about the way we see the world and the stories don't necessarily correspond to the reality and the stories can be changed. And given that the stories have driven us to this violence, stories need to be changed. And the importance of that kind of understanding, I think, is, has just really come home. Changing the way that we see, changing the narratives, telling new stories or retelling old stories that made more sense than the ones we're, that, that are we've woven into this culture. Has become so, it's become so clear how important that is. You know, it can sound trivial to some people. They say, oh, what are you going to do, write a poem in the face of climate change when you should be out there campaigning against it? Well, it's, that's not the point. The point is that unless you understand the way you're looking at it and understand the stories that got you there, then, then there'll be more of the same. And the importance of that is really, has really been driven home to me over this, over this five years. And I think you've got a final Yeah, I suppose the last thing thought, that I wanted you? to bring up that has come out of my experience of this is a recognition of how badly our ways of talking about things that matter are out of joint. And the, the experience that brought that home to me most painfully was spending an hour and, towards an hour and a half, we ran over on stage going head to head with George Monbiot at the first Dark Mountain Festival. And George had you know, written various things in The Guardian, including sort of debating with um, both of us about what Dark Mountain was saying and he came to the festival and um, he kind of he came out fighting in that way that he does and uh, George is a really he's been a really important campaigner and advocate and a really important interface between you know, the edges and the center in the role that he has played um, in the media in this country 
Um, but honestly, after an hour and a half of us being on stage, I felt like we'd wasted our time and we'd wasted the time of the people in the room and it felt very fruitless. And the reason it felt fruitless was because it had been conducted as a debate, as an exercise in point scoring. And George is very good at that much better than I am, much better than I want to be. And I came off that stage thinking, you know, I don't want to get good at the thing that we just did because it feels ridiculous, you know, staging an argument as if you can meaningfully reduce it to two sides and as if one of those sides is going to turn out to be right and one of those sides is going to turn out to be wrong. You know, that game feels very over or very out of proportion to the seriousness of what we're talking about. It's not a grown-up way of engaging, but unfortunately it's almost the only way that our media has of presenting, of holding public conversations. And so one of the things that's come out of Dark Mountain for me and that's been feeding a lot of the other work I've done over the last few years is a really strong desire to find other ways of having conversations in public that are not simply about having a warm, cosy, groupthink consensus either. We have to be able to acknowledge difference and difficulty and disagreement, but to do it in a way that doesn't reduce it to that kind of staged combat, which is very male. It's very excluding to people who are not naturally given to that. And that's, you know, that's not just about it being you know, excluding to women, it's about it being excluding to men being themselves in other ways than this particular narrow, macho, combative mode of intellectual um, combat and so somehow we have to find because I, that was the other thing I didn't want to feel like because I wasn't prepared to play that game that meant I had to retreat from being able to uh, be engaged in the serious public conversation about these these issues and things that matter and I just think that the situation we're in is too serious to be continuing to allow the public debate to be conducted in the manner of these kind of sixth formish uh, public school arguments. And um, uh, I don't have the answer to how we get past that, but that's something that I've become really alive to and interested in exploring with people and in the, the work and the projects that I'm doing now, both in and outside of Dark Mountain.